uh, written by Goethe, a tragic, uh, a tragic play. So it says, mit euch, Herr Doktor, zu spazieren, ist ehrenvoll und ist Gewinn. So wh why, I, why did I choose this? First of all, it's from a part where Faust, the great hero and scientist, talks to his student, Wagner, and explains him the world. And his student is very grateful and appreciate, appreciates this very much. And this is what Jean-Michel occasionally does to me, explain me the world, which means the, the world of mathematics <laughs> and also other issues. So I'm very grateful to him for sharing all his in deep insights in the mathematics and the world in general with me. <laughs> but I also have chosen this for a different reason, because Jean-Michel is a great lover of German uh, poetry. He reads poetry and likes in particular to read Goethe and Faust, which is for a non-native speaker a very difficult problem. Anyway, but he seems to master this, and so this is another reason for choosing this. So here I have, uh, so to speak, this is a kind of translation. It does not capture the true meaning of what is supposed to mean. In particular, how a doctor includes, involves much more appreciation than just to say doctor in English. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now let's start with the subject. So there are certain things in the title, like localizing metric spaces, and let me explain what this is all about. So, well, in general, we consider a semi-simple real, real leak group, and this is supposed to be non-compact. It's allowed to have compact factors. And so we choose an XML compact subgroup, and then we can talk about the associated Riemannian symmetric space. So this is, in this case, has non-positive curvature, and it's diffeomorphic to Rn. And then we pick a lattice in our Lie group G, which is a discrete subgroup, and which is sufficiently large, expressed by this condition, that the volume of G mod gamma is finite. So, and then we have, take this quotient, gamma acts probably discontinuously, so we can form this quotient, and this is a locally symmetric space. Okay, you have a misspelling. Well, in most cases, I will be interested if gamma is torsion-free. In this case, we end up with a manifold, and furthermore, for most part of this talk, this will be actually compact. I will assume that this space is compact. Only at the very end, I will talk a little bit about the non-compact case. So and then, we also are concerned with the notion of an arithmetic lattice. So this, to some extent, has been explained yesterday by Nicolas Bergeron. He gave examples where you derive arithmetic lattices from uh, quadratic forms. Well, you can think an example, this is a typical example of an arithmetic lattice. The only s problem is that it's not co-compact, so the quotient is not compact and it has torsion. So, so this is essentially the concept of an arithmetic lattice. So here I have included a more precise definition, so we have we take an <coughs> a semi-simple algebraic group which is defined over the rationals, so essentially given by the zeros of rational of <coughs> polynomials with rational coefficients, and then, so to speak, the real points. This is our group G. Maybe we take the connected component, and then the lattice. This is a subgroup in the rational points, which is commensurable with to speak, the integer points. So, here are some I, here are some examples, as I said. So, the simple, oh, the simplest case is uh, the upper half plane, equipped with the Poincaré matrix. So, 
everybody knows, I think this is the quotient of SL2R by SO2. And then a standard and important discrete group is the principal congruent subgroup of level N, consisting of integer two by two matrices, which are congruent, congruent to the identity mod N. And then we can form this quotient. If N is bigger than three, then this is a, a, a just a hyperbolic surface because the group is torsion free. So we, it's a modular surface. Higher dimensional case arise, for higher dimensional case, we may consider the hyperbolic space. So this is, of course, <coughs> uh, the homogeneous description, the isometry group of the hyperbolic space. And then, for example, we might co may consider the integer matrices and take any congruent subgroup in here, then we end up with a hyperbolic manifold. Again, this is non-compact, a non-compact example. Or the higher rank case, standard example of the higher rank case would be we take the space of <coughs> symmetric, positive, definite, n by n matrices of determinant one. So this is, as a symmetric space, it's given in this way. This is the invariant metric on this space. And then we consider, again, SLN set integer n by n matrices with determinant one and congruent subgroups. So we take the quotient. This is another example of a locally symmetric space, which is of interest for us. However, all of these examples are non-compact. <coughs> Here is the, the picture how we can in dimension two, we, we know every Riemann surface of genus at least two has this form by the uniformization theorem. There is a discrete group on the upper half plane such that, or this is the fundamental group that's such that the corresponding quotient is this surface. And you can also look, or uh, there are many other geometric relations for discrete groups, so you can also consider a discrete group or study a discrete group by taking its fundamental domain. So like this one, hyperbolic triangle, and then here and reflect or consider the group generated by reflection at the boundary. So in this case, it's a Coxeter group and then translate with group elements these fundamental domains everywhere, and you end up with this very nice tessellation. So this is, has been provided by my dear colleague, Herbert Koch in Bonn, who knows how to produce such nice pictures. And well, here, so local symmetric spaces are related to many different fields, and here we are mainly interested in analysis. So to do analysis on local symmetric spaces and this has many relations, or has relations to many different fields like uh, representation theory, theory of automorphic forms, and number theory. And an, an important link between these subjects is provided by the cohomology. So here, uh, by cohomology, I mean the following. So we consider a finite dimensional representation of the underlying Lie group then we can restrict this representation to gamma, to our sub lattice gamma. So we, we get a module, a gamma module, and we can talk about the group cohomology of gamma with coefficients in this module. So this is the kind of cohomology which we are interested in. Well, in principle, you could consider any uh, gamma module, but for all these purposes here, it's only of interest if the gamma module arises from a representation of of the Lie group G. So especially, or in particular, if we assume that our group gamma is torsion free, then we can take this gamma module and it has an associated uh, flat vector bundle in the standard, associated with this representation in the standard way. And then the group cohomology is just the Durham cohomology of the uh, associated locally symmetric space with coefficients in this flat bundle. And this isomorphism 
provides us with many analytic tools to study the cohomology. So we have the theory of Hodge theory and many other tools are available. And yeah, so here I'm just, um, just quoting two examples which makes this clear, more clear what I mean that there are relations with coma, of cohomology with other fields. So there's the a classical Aichler Shimura isomorphism. So we consider a lattice, for example, a subgroup of finite lineage in SL2 set, but could be a more general group. And we consider the, the case symmetric power. So, well, this is the standard, repre standard irre irreducible representation. We take the case symmetric power and the case symmetric power of the standard representation. So if we consider the cohomology with coefficients in the associated flat bundle, then this is known to be isomorphic to the space of uh, holomorphic cusp forms of weight k and its complex conjugate. And well, because the surface is non-compact, there is also another the contribution of Eisenstein series. So cohomology, this is, so to speak, a more precise statement uh, saying that the cohomology uh, can be described in terms of automorphic forms. And there's uh, also a very gener a general statement or a general result like this, <coughs> known as the Porel conjecture. So if we have any lattice in a semi-simple Lie group, we consider the space of automorphic forms, which means functions which are in here, which are k finite. This means if we consider the space of all right translates of functions by k, then this spans a finite dimensional space. And then we also have the center of the universal enveloping algebra, which acts by differential operators on functions. And then you have also to assume that if you act on a function in here, then this also spans a finite dimensional space. So in particular, an eigenfunction of the sensor would be <coughs> in here. And then it's a theorem of Franke. Well, this is, so to speak, the, the version, one version. The group cohomology is isomorphic to the G, so the certain Lie algebra cohomology with coefficients in the space of automorphic forms twisted by this local system. So it essentially means you can derive a more sophisticated statement from it that homology classes somehow rep are represented by automorphic forms by uh, special values of Eisenstein series and so on. So, and there, well, if we talk about arithmetic groups, then th there is an additional feature in the case of arithmetic groups, we have certain operators called Hecker operators, which act on the cohomology. They, they are defined algebraically, but this is, so to speak, the important feature of arithmetic groups, the existence of Hecker operators. And then there are general uh, conjectures, important conjectures to the Langlands, that one expects that eigenclasses in the cohomology correspond to Galois representations, and there has been a lot of work done in this direction. And well, if we talk, so the, the cohomology of such groups has been studied to a great extent by many people. I, am not, I did not write down any because it's easy to, to miss some and then uh, I would be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> So, but so one important question in, the, in this uh, context is that you want to study, you want to understand the size of the cohomology groups in a certain sense. And well, in a certain sense means, for example, this is an example what you want to understand. So this is a theorem which holds in much more generality. It's not uh, restricted to locally symmetric spaces. Um, so you consider, for example, the fundamental group of some uh, 
finite CW complex and a decreasing subgroup uh, sequence of normal subgroups, which intersect in the identity, and then the result is if you take the Betty numbers for the corresponding covering defined by gamma n and divide by the decree, then this has a limit, and the limit is the so-called L2 Betty number, though this is the concept introduced by Artia. So I'm not recalling what the L2 Betty number is. Uh, but it has a limit given by some constant which is, has a precise geometric meaning. Well, and this has been, this result has been generalized to a great extent by these six authors, among them Nicolas Bergeron, who <coughs> gave a talk yesterday. So this generalization is based on the concept of Benjamin Schramm con convergence. And it means roughly the following. So we consider now any sequence of lattices uh, in G and consider the corresponding uh, quotient. Uh, so this is the symmetric space. And then for any R, <coughs> we consider, so to speak, the thin part, which means the set of points where the injectivity radius is less than R. And then one says that it, this sequence of coverings converges to the, so to speak, universal covering if for every R, so to speak, this quotient tends to zero. So, well, this is a very <coughs> important achievement because it allows, to, in all these questions related to coverings and growth of cohomology, it allows to consider much more general sequences than just uh, normal subgroups of finite index. So, and well, now coming back to this uh, uh, result of Lück, which is related to the L2 Betty number. Well, so we introduce here some invariant of the group, which means we take the complex rank of G minus the complex rank of K. And then it turns out, well, in this locally symmetric setup, the L2 Betty number can be computed. It turns out that it's non-zero only if First of all, if we are in the equal rank case, then the quotient is even dimensional, and then it only is, is non-zero if we are in this degree, half of the dimension. So here are some examples. So of course, um, so <coughs> these are groups equal where, which admit <coughs> a, <coughs> yeah, so to speak, a compact Cardan subgroup. So then we are in the equivalent rank case. And this is the important case for this talk if G is equal to one. So an example, of the, well, the irreducible cases are SOPQ with P and Q R and SL3 and SL4. And then, for example, SL and R for N bigger or equal to five, then the, the difference is bigger or equal to two. So well, so one case which where you want to understand the cohomology is this in the, in the context of coverings. How, how does the cohomology grow if you go up in a, in a tower of uh, coverings? But the other, the other case is, so to speak, orthogonal to this one, you fix your lattice, like here in the, in the SL2C case. Then we, we are talking about a hyperbolic manifold, and you let the local system grow. So here, we just take, so this is, uh, yeah. So we consider the nth symmetric power tensor, it's complex conjugate. This is an irreducible, <coughs> one of the irreducible representations of SL2C considered as a real group. And then, well, if the lattice is co-compact and we would consider the same kind of thing, except that we choose here another degree m. If n is different from m, then all the cohomology vanishes. So the only interesting case that remains is if n, for, for, this, for these questions, is, 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 n, is n is equal to m. And then, I mean, Grunewald has 
done extensive computations and tried to understand the, what can be said about the cohomology with this local coefficient system. And here, this is one non-trivial estimate. I mean, this, the trivial one would be n squared, but so they, the three of these, were able to reduce this non-trivial estimate. And this has been significantly improved by Marsh, Simon Marshall. So he gets actually n to minus epsilon. So these are, for example, some s examples of issues which you want to study. But so now you can ask, OK, so far we only consider the Duran cohomology. The question is, can we say anything about torsion in the cohomology? Well, this means, of course, if you want to talk about torsion, we have to have integer cohomology available. Well, if the coefficient system is trivial, then it's clear what we are talking about. But if you have a non-trivial coefficient system, then we have to have a lattice in the corresponding representation space, which is invariant under gamma. And this is, of course, the place where the condition that gamma is arithmetic comes in again, because such a lattice exists in arith for arithmetic groups. And then we can talk about the group cohomology with coefficients in this lattice. So this is becomes a finitely generated abelian group, and so we can talk about torsion. In particular, if gamma is torsion-free, then it has a topolo this topological description. So we have this gamma module M. It has an associated uh, local system of free finite rank set modules. And then we can talk about the cohomology of our space with coefficients in this local system. So for example, if we dealing with the trivial representation, then this is just the uh, standard. Oh, so I'm sorry, this is a mistake. So here, this should be set, the integers. And so now, one of the question is, are there analogous results for the torsion? Analogous results, for example, the those which I have discussed so far. Can we say anything about growth of torsion if we move up in a tower of coverings or if this local system grows in a certain uh, precise manner? Well, and there are many reasons to study torsion in the cohomology. Uh, but where, well, it's related to the Langlands program where you expect that torsion classes, which are eigenclasses of the Hecker operators, correspond to uh, Galois representations over finite fields. And, okay, and here, uh, so some of the first, so Bergeron and Denkatesh have thought about this question, and here is, yeah, so, uh, and this, under these circumstances, so we, we consider, so speak, we have to consider again arithmetic subgroups, so which I described at the very beginning. So we have a semi simple algebraic group over Q. G is the group of real points, and so on. And our group is a subgroup in the integer, uh, in the rational points, which is commensurable with the integer points. And then, so we have this algebraic group over Q, and we consider irrational representation of our algebraic group on, on some Q vector space. And then, well, this is implicit in the uh, definition of an arithmetic uh, group. Then there is some lattice in the representation space which is invariant under this group. And now consider a dis decreasing sequence of concurrent subgroups which intersect in one. Then a conjecture of Bergeron and Venkatesh says, well, there is some constant such that, well, so to speak, the Betty number in the real case is now replaced. So we take the order of the torsion subgroup in the cohomology and the logarithm. So now this replaces, so to speak, the, uh, the Betty number in the real case. And we normalize this number, and then the conjecture is 
it there is a constant which depends only on the group and this lattice. And the main ingredient here in the limit, so there is a limit and the main ingredient is the volume of the corresponding local symmetric space. And moreover, one expects so that the constant is zero, the, the interest, unless this constant, which is the difference of the complex rank of G and K is one. And it only gives some non-zero result in this degree. So you have in this case, you, you expect the constant to be positive. So and now it turns out that um, to study this question or th this kind of conjecture, it's related to the other name in the title, namely analytic torsion. Well, this is something which has been around for a long time. It was introduced by uh, Ray and Singer in the, 90s, in the 1970s. But, well, on the other hand, it's also a subject on which it, well, uh, uh, Jean Michel has been very much interested in and has made a lot of contribution to. Well, in the, when in the real Duram and uh, in the Duram setting and in the complex, particular in the ana complex analytic setting. So, but now it turns out that this is uh, an analytic tool to study these questions. So let me recall w what is what analytic torsion is all about. So this is first of all we are in the context of a general of a compact Riemannian manifold. And then we consider a representation, finite dimensional representation of the fundamental group. This representation has an associated flat vector bundle. Well, in general, if it's not, if this is not a unitary representation, we, we pick an arbitrary emission fiber metric in this flat bundle so we can talk about the twisted Duran complex. It has associated in our product and we can talk about the Laplace operator on P forms with coefficients in this flat bundle. Well, this is a elliptic operator, self joint non-negative and we are on a compact manifold. Therefore, it has a pure point spectrum consisting of a sequence of eigenvalues going to infinity and then Using these eigenvalues, we introduce the so-called zeta function associated to this operator, which is this generalized Dirichlet series, converges in this half plane, and it's well known that it admits a meromorphic extension to C, which in particular is holomorphic at S equals zero. And then we define the regularized determinant of this operator by this expression, which is formally the product of the eigenvalues. Uh, yeah, on the, uh, of the non-zero eigenvalues. And then Ray and Singer introduced this spectral invariant called the analytic torsion. So it's a weighted product uh, by these exponents of the uh, regularized determinants of these twisted uh, Laplace operators. Well, as you can see, the definition involves is through the Laplace operator, so it definitely depends on the metric on our Riemann manifold and the metric which we have chosen in the flat bundle. However, it turns out that if the dimension of, our, of the underlying manifold is odd and the cohomology vanishes, so with coefficients in the flat bundle, such a flat bundle is called acyclic, then, in, in fact, it's not difficult to see that this number is independent of all choices of metrics on our manifold and on the flat bundle. And, well, there is also, so you, this, of course, suggests that it might may have a topological description, and there's indeed one. So there's a topological counterpart called the Reidemeister torsion introduced by Reidemeister in the 30s, Reidemeister and Franz. Well, it's defined 
combinatorially, so you, you choose a triangle, have to choose a triangulation of the manifold. And then <coughs> the Durham complex, <coughs> the twisted Durham complex gets replaced by the corresponding cold chain complex twisted by the corresponding local system. And then you can, so if you pick, so if you declare the simplices to be a bit then twisted by, <coughs> well, let's say if the representation is trivial, then you just take the simplices and declare them to be an orthonormal basis. So you get some inner product, canonical inner product in here, and then you just re <coughs> define, so to speak, a combinatorial Laplace operator in the same way as you define the smooth one. You take the adjoint of the co-boundary operator and write down the same formula as for the uh, Hodge Laplace operator. This is a kind of combinatorial Laplace operator. It's not the combinatorial Laplace operator the numerical analysts would talk about, but it's pure combinatorial description. And then you just take this formula, defining the analytic torsion and replace the Hutch Laplace operator by this uh, combinatorial one. The prime means, of course, we delete. Uh, we forget about the, we don't, this is on the orthogonal complement. Determinant is taken for the restriction to the orthogonal complement of the kernel. Of course, the, it was the other way around. Uh, Ray and Singer started with this reformulation of the Reidemeister torsion, and then they just conjectured this formula here. And now it's, well, the theorem due to Chia and myself that the two invariants actually coincide. And then this, I mean, this is initially it was proved for unitary representations only, but it has been extended. So I extended this to unimodular representations, which are defined by this property. And then Bismuth and Chan considered the general case, any arbitrary representation. But then, in general, this equality is not true. There is a defect which they can define or describe very in detail. But the important cor corollary, uh, corollary is that if we are in this situation which we are interested in, namely in our representation space, there is a lattice which is invariant under the group, in this case it's the uh, fundamental group. Then using this equality here, it can be shown that the analytic torsion is equal to this expression. So the alternating product of the orders of the torsion subgroups times another number constant called the regulator. So the regulator is, comes from the free part. So, well, first of all, it's an alternating product of numbers associated to a fixed degree P. And then this number is essentially uh, is the co-volume. So you consider the free part of your cohomology with coefficients in this uh, local system. So it's a lattice in the real cohomology, and you equip the real cohomology with the norm induced by the, uh, you know, by the isomorph, by the Hodge isomorphism with the uh, uh, harmonic forms, and then it's the co-volume of this lattice. In particular, if the cohomology, the real cohomology vanishes, then this is it's just a finite abelian group, and we have this equality. The torsion, analytic torsion, is equal to the so then everything is uh, torsion, and it's equal to the order of these uh, alternating order of these product alternating product of the order of these uh, torsion groups. So that's of course an interesting equality because, on the one hand, this is a spectral invariant defined in terms of eigenvalues of certain Laplace operators, and here we have something topological. So this is. Uh, it's actually a rational number, so it's a very somehow surprising equality because you would never see this on the analytic side that <laughs> these uh, complicated 
a spectral expression is, is a rational number. And here is a very simple example where you can see this. Well, this makes sense more, uh, more generally for any ch chain complex. So consider this chain complex here, this simple chain complex. And A is multiplication by some integer, D. And then we see uh, the determinant, which would be the Reidemeister torsion in this case, is just equal to the order of the corresponding to the first Cromagy group or homology group of this complex. So now, so this opens up, well, because we have here, we end up here with the torsion, or let's say here, with the torsion subgroups in the Cromagy. So this opens up the possibility or to study torsion by analytic tools, namely through the analytic torsion. And now let me talk about results. So there is one case which is deals with coverings, sequences of coverings. So we are in the previous situation. We have our symmetric space, a lattice and a locally associated locally symmetric space. And we consider, for example, a sequence of congruent subgroups. And then this means we have a sequence of finite coverings. And well, we also there's we consider coefficients given by some representation, finite dimensional representation of our Lie group G. And so we get associated flat bundles over each of these covering spaces. And now for analytic reasons, we have to restrict attention to special representations. And these are called strongly acyclic. So this means, so if we consider the Laplace operator on each of these covering spaces with coefficients in the flat bundle, then the condition is that the spectrum of all these operators has a uniform positive lower bound. So there's a spectral gap, a uniform spe spectral gap around zero. So for <coughs> the techniques which one uses in this context, this is a necessary assumption. It's uh, unfortunate, but it's unavoidable at the moment. And then, first of all, there's a general theorem due to Bergeron and Venkadesh saying that in this context where we are, namely in the case of <coughs> Uh, that such uh, local systems exist. So strongly acyclic representations of local, uh, local systems exist in the context which we are concerned with here. So and a typical example would be we consider SL2C. So the corresponding symmetric space is the uh, hyperbolic three space. And then we consider the standard irreducible representation of SL2C, yeah, given in this way, product of symmetric powers. And whenever P is different from Q, then this representation has this property. Then one can show that there is a universal spectral gap for all these uh, Laplace operators. And so here is one of the uh, <coughs> main results in this context, due also due to Bergeron and Venkatesh. So if we have a strongly acyclic representation and we consider a sequence, a given arithmetic group and a sequence of congruent subgroups, so, and which are such that the injectivity, so they all, at the moment I'm always talking about cases where the a group is co-compact. So all these quotients uh, are compact uh, manifolds. And then on the assumption that the injectivity radius of this manifold goes to infinity, then they can show that <coughs> if you take the logarithm of the analytic torsion with coefficients in this in the local system associated to rho, renormalized by the degree of the covering then this has a limit, and the limit is the so-called 
the logarithm of the so-called L2 torsion. So L2 torsion has been introduced by John Lott and it uses, so to speak, the same concept as uh, well, Atia used to define the L2 Betty numbers. So you, well, I cannot define this, but it, it uses, so to speak, So you, you define this in the same way as, in a similar way as you define this invariant, but you have to, so to speak, define dimensions in the von, von Neumann sense and so on. So, but in our case, so because this has a very simple description, in our case, because this is the symmetric space which is homogeneous, and then it turns out that this number is just essential. This is the volume of the manifold defined by our initial lattice gamma and some constant. So this constant depends only on the representation and the symmetric space and, uh, and not on the discrete proof. And this can be, so to speak, computed explicitly using the Plancharel theorem and so on. And, you know, So, and now <coughs> we assume, we so we then return to this representation of the Lie group and we assume that it's strongly acyclic and arithmetic. Arithmetic means it comes from, so there is an underlying algebraic group for which this is the group of real points. We have rational representation of the algebraic group and so th this is so to speak a restriction to the real points and then there is a lattice in this case there is a lattice in the representation space which is gamma invariant so this is just the rational representation of our algebraic group and now if you apply this formula here the analytic torsion is given by this alternating product of torsion groups. If you apply it to this result here, if you replace the logarithm by this alternating product, then you end up with this formula. So it takes the torsion subgroups. In fact, everything is torsion under these assumptions. And the alternating sum renormalized by the degree converges to this number. And well, then, as I said, this number can be computed by standard methods using the Plancherel theorem, and it turns out that in this case, if the difference of the ranks of G and K is 1, then it's non-zero. And, well, and so if we assume that X is odd, then we can conclude, or this is what Dajan and Denkaresch conclude, that the torsion, so this number is then non-zero and it follows that at least torsion in one of these groups grows exponentially. So here is uh, just an example. Uh, no, I'm not so we consider the hyperbolic three space and then there, there is some way uh, you can define a compact arithmetic subgroup in SL2C if you in some yeah by using uh, quaternion division algebra over FF. I just have chosen it to be an imaginary quadratic field, and then the algebraic group is so to speak the norm one elements in this division algebra. So this is the algebraic group. It's an algebraic group over this field. Over the complex numbers, it's just SL2C, and the rational points are just the norm one elements in the division algebra. And then, if we choose an order and take the norm one elements, then this defines an arithmetic uh, co compact lattice in here. And now, if we take the symmetric powers of the standard representation of SL2C, 
then we end up with a strongly acyclic representation, which in even decrease has an invariant gamma invariant lattice. And then this result of, fun of in this case, fun the, the, this main result of Bergeron and Lenkadesh has the following corollary, namely, one can conclude that the first co homology of gamma n with coefficients in this lattice uh, renormalized has exactly uh, this limit, namely the volume of the hyperbolic manifold times some constant which can be computed explicitly. So this is one case. Now let's consider the other case, namely we fix uh, the lattice. So the lattice is now fixed and instead we vary the local systems. So how do you vary local systems? Here's the example. <coughs> Again, we consider a hyperbolic three manifold and then the nth symmetric power of the standard representation. And so we take this representation restricted to gamma, we get a local system and we can talk about the analytic torsion, the spectral invariant, this coefficient in the associated flat bundle and this is, and then we get the following result. If we consider the logarithm of the analytic torsion, this coefficient in these representations, then it grows like m squared and the coefficient is given essentially by the volume. So this has, among other things, the corollary that the, so the corresponding Reidemeister torsion, which are completely combinatorial, defined this set of Reidemeister torsion determine the volume of this hyperbolic manifold. And <coughs> now if we take an arithmetic subgroup, co-compact arithmetic subgroup derived from a division quaternion division algebra, then for the even symmetric powers admit <coughs> an invariant lattice, so we can talk about the integer cohomology with coefficients in this local system, and then a consequence of this result is, this is this joint <coughs> paper with, or jointly obtained with Simon Marshall, then we actually can conclude, so now we do the same thing, we return to the theorem which says the analytic torsion is an alternating product of the orders of the torsion groups. If we apply this, then it actually follows that the second cohomology, the logarithm divided by k squared grows as a limit and the limit is the volume. And then you can also say that <coughs> in decrease different from, s from s two, the cohomology grows of lower order. Or restated in terms of homology, then it means the homology, the first homology, grows exponentially. So now, let's, uh, let me say a few things about the higher dimensions. So this was just an example. So what can you say about higher dimensions? Now we consider any compact locally symmetric space. So I have to introduce some notation and we pick let this be the Lie algebra, we pick a fundamental Cardan sub-algebra and so assume that G is just a subgroup of the complex complexified Lie group, then we take its compact real form and so on and we consider the irreducible finite dimensional representations of G and U and then the basic result is that these representations are the rep finite the real representations are equivalent. So we can t talk about highest highest weight of representations of G, and so I will always denote. So I pick a highest weight, and then I will denote by tau lambda the corresponding irreducible representation. Well, it's the irreducible representation of U, this highest weight lambda, which corresponds to a representation of G, and then. We also have the Cardan involution with respect to K and then lambda theta will denote the highest weight of this representation composed with the Cardan, uh, with the Cardan uh, involution. 
So and in this general context, we have now the following, the following results. So the first one is to this mood Ma on Chang and I on Puff proved it by different methods. So it says that if we are outside, if this invariant difference of the ranks is not equal to one, then this just vanishes. So there's nothing interesting we can expect in this case. Uh, so we just restrict to this case. So assume that dimension is odd and the difference of the ranks is one when we pick a high, highest weight with this assumption. So the representation defined by lambda is not equivalent to the representation obtained by composing with the color and involution. And then we, so we consider now rays of representations given by, so we pick a fixed highest weight and consider the ray obtained from this lambda by multiplying with some natural number and the corresponding sequence of representations. And then the general result is the following. The analytic torsion, the logarithm grows polynomially. So there's a polynomial in M which only depends on lambda and it has this precise description. So the constant here in front of it depends only on the highest weight. This constant can be computed explicitly and of course by Wiles dimension formula we know that this is a polynomial in M. And so there's some lower order term. And then it grows like this, like a polynomial in M. Well, in fact, uh, the, the, this mode Ma and Chang only determine the, the leading order. And this gives a complete asymptotic expansion of the analytic torsion. And it follows from the following uh, general fact, namely it's due to this mood Ma and Sang and Puff and me proved it in a different way. So the logarithm actually of the analytic torsion converges to the L2 torsion. So and this mood Ma and Chang studied this also in a much more general context, namely in the context of uh, analytic torsion forms on arbitrary compact manifolds and proved, so to speak, corresponding results. So here's an application, another one, namely we take, for example, this symmetric space associated to SL3R and then SL2R has two fundamental, there are two fundamental weights in this case and if we consider the corresponding, uh, these are the fundamental weights and if we consider the corresponding race of representation obtained by these weights, then we have we end up again with a very nice asymptotic formula, namely logarithm of the analytic torsion grows like m cubed, and the main ingredient is the volume of the manifold, and this is the compact dual symmetric uh, space. Well, this has <coughs> again, well, if you re restrict now to the arithmetic case, namely if you assume that this is an arithmetic lattice and you have uh, lattices in a representation space which are invariant under the group, then you get corresponding statements about the growth of the torsion of the cohomology. So again, having seen this example of the hyperbolic three, three manifold, you would expect that the same thing is true, namely the main part of the torsion occurs in decrease three. And this would grow exactly like this. And the other outside uh, decrease three, the growth is of lower order. Well, there are similar results for the other cases, namely we take this symmetric space for the orthogonal group of index PQ for P and Q art, but the statements are more complicated. Uh, yeah, now I have absolutely well, no much time to say much about proofs. Uh, uh, so the main, one of the main ingredients in the proof is this, this lemma. Under the assumption, under this non-degeneracy assumption, you can show that the spectrum of the twisted Laplace operator has not only a gap at zero, but the gap grows 
like m squared. So the spectrum is shifted to infinity. So this is, so to speak, the main ingredient. And well, maybe I just, so it means that, for example, the trace of the corresponding heat operator decays exponentially in T if T goes to infinity. This is so because we have no kernel. And then one of the main things, or one of what is used is that the zeta function is given by the Mellin transform of the trace of the heat operator. And then if you write down this uh, combination of the traces of the heat operators, then the analytic torsion can be is given by just this formula. This is, of course, defined by analytic continuation. And then you take this sequence and representations, and so we have this integral for the Mellian transform. We decompose the integral in two parts, and this one and this one. And then using this main lemma about the, that the spectrum is shifted way to infinity with m growth of m squared, then it just follows that this term is exponentially decreasing. And then you have to deal with this part. And here you use essentially the Selvig trace formula. So the Selvig trace formula re expresses this as a sum <coughs> of <coughs> terms associated to the different conjugacy classes. And it turns out that the contribution of the non-trivial conjugacy classes also exponentially decays. So the only contribution comes from the identity, and this is exactly this term plus something exponentially decreasing. So this is, again, the L2 torsion. So, so, so this is uh, only a very rough idea how you prove this. So uh, first let me briefly mention that there are other results in this direction, namely Caligari and Venkatesh have used the same method, namely analytic torsion, to study another issue. There is the, so, the Shakay Langlands correspondence, which associates, so to speak, automorphic forms on different groups, uh, on different, uh, yeah, inner forms of the same group. And so they use this to establish, so to speak, a certain numerical form of Charlie Langlands uh, correspondence in the torsion setting. So, but there's no time to say more about this. Then, uh, just let me say something about the finite volume case. So far, everything was about uh, the compact case. But first of all, there are many interesting discrete groups, like this one, SL2, with coefficients in the Gaussian integers, or this one and its congruent subgroups, which are, so to speak, very interesting for arithmetic reasons. However, the corresponding quotients are all non-compact. So it's a natural question, can one extend all these methods, which I described in the pre on the previous slides, to the non-compact setting? Well, this has a number of problems, of course. And the first problem is, if the manifold is non-compact, then the corresponding Laplace operators have Besides of the discrete spectrum, they have a large continuous spectrum. And so all the methods which we used so far break down. In particular, the zeta function cannot be defined in the usual way. Well, because this trace doesn't make any sense. But there is a way to regularize this trace. So to introduce a regularized version in this trace, uh, for this trace, and then one can use the corresponding formula to define at least the analytic torsion in this case. And so there has been work, first of all, by Sean Ray and Bo. He considers congruent subgroups in the Pianchi groups, OF, the ring of integers in a imaginary quadratic field, and establish this, <coughs> uh, extends the results of Bergeron and Venkatesh to this setting, namely convergence of the uh, renormalized torsion and so on. And there's also ongoing work of Pfaff 
and myself, we are dealing with hyperbolic manifolds of finite volume in general. And here, list of problems, finally. So the first thing is that for all this to work, we have to assume that this local system is strongly acyclic, which is, of course, uh, some restriction. For example, you would like to prove all these results for the trivial coefficient system. But then we don't have this uh, uniform uh, spectral gap because, for example, if you move up in the tower of coverings, then in the middle dimension it turns out that eigenvalues of the Laplace operator on p-form in the middle dimension cluster, ten, tend to cluster near zero. And this destroys many of these analytic arguments. So you, we cannot deal with such a case so far. And then the other thing is that in the non-compact setting, we don't have such a formula relation between analytic torsion and topological torsion so far. Well, there, there is some hope that this can be established for, for example, hyperbolic three manifolds or related spaces, but this is still not done yet. And the other thing is there is, in general, the cohomology, if the cohomology, the real cohomology does not vanish, then you have to deal with the regulator. There are, so to speak, so the regulator, which was the, the take the lattice of the free part in the real cohomology and want to compute the co-volume. And this turns out to be a very difficult problem. So, so far, one doesn't have many methods to get our hand on this problem. And then, of course, the ultimate goal would be to extend everything to the finite volume and higher rank case. But then, of course, the analytic difficulties uh, increase tremendously. And, for example, the Selvig trace formula needs to be replaced by the Arthur trace formula, which is one of the main tools to study these questions. And there is a lot of analytic problems related to this, but there's also a lot of work to do, and so it's always good if you have some work to do. So that's, <laughs> that's the end of the talk.